welcome, 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 welcome. It's my pleasure, my privilege, my honor to be here with you. May 16th, 2017, my 76th birthday. Been in practice as a psychologist for 45 years. The title of today's lecture is the 20, 25 Fountains of Youth. 25 Fountains of Youth, and I'm dedicating the lecture to Alex Torres, who has some very interesting ideas uh, as, as I was developing this lecture. So I'm grateful to him. Uh, what I did also to help celebrate my birthday and to show the effect of, of the information I'm going to give you is because I apply it to myself, these 25 fountains. Uh, I, I will do 25 pull-ups. Nah, just kidding. 15. I'm going to do 15 pull-ups. Dr. Arnold Nuremberg, today's my 76th birthday. The title of the class today is The 25 Fountains of Youth. Uh, let's see if I can demonstrate my youthfulness. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. And those pull-ups were inspired by Anthony Escamilla. He kind of challenged me to do it, kind of got me going into doing more pull-ups. So there you see it, 15 pull-ups. Uh, as you can tell from the way I got that last one, there was not 16 in me today anyway. I did have a world record on a power pull-up when I was a young man of 71. And I uh, hung 140 pounds on a chain belt and did a pull-up. That was a world record. Wow, it was a long time ago, five years ago at 71. So the title of today's lecture, as I said, is 25 Fountains of Youth. And uh, the first one we're going to talk about is oxygen. Oxygen. And so there are not, we're going to talk about the ways that oxygen affects our cells, uh, the way we can maximize our oxygen absorption, and the effects of what happens with oxygen deficiencies and, and oxygen sufficiencies. Most people don't know this, but uh, oxygen can prevent, being highly oxygenated, could help prevent various cancers. Because many cancers can't live uh, in an oxygenated environment. So it doesn't apply to all cancers, but many cannot. Now, there are meters you can get at a reasonable price, such as this. You put it on your finger like that, and it'll measure uh, your pulse rate and also measure your oxygenation level. So you just put it on. So I'm going to put this like this. I'm going to probably have a fast pulse because I just did those pull-ups. And then we do the deep breathing. 98% oxygenation. My pulse rate, from because I just did those pull-ups, uh, is 78. Normally it's around 58. So 98% oxygenation. That's pretty good. You, you want it above 94. So there you, there you have it. So, now, so the oxygenation, there are different ways of bringing in certain minerals that will help you maximize your oxygen absorption. Certain minerals. One of, the, one of those is iron. When you have iron in your hemoglobin, if you have an iron deficiency, you're not going to be able to shuttle as much oxygen to your cells. So the hemoglobin in the blood cells carries the oxygen to all your cells, your brain cells, your muscle cells, your organs. Every cell in your body requires oxygenation. Absolutely. All life form on, on Earth requires oxygenation. Now, oxygen is produced by plants during the process of photosynthesis. You have the, the chloroform and the presence of sunlight uh, that produces, uh, it, it takes transfer of carbon dioxide, uh, and, and in, a, in a process of photosynthesis, It'll bring in and produce sugar, C6, H12O6, and oxygen, O2. Uh, so you get it, that's just part of the process of photosynthesis. So you're getting oxygen produced by plants. We cannot manufacture oxygen ourselves, but plants can. But we can certainly be bringing oxygen in uh, through our breathing. 
Um, most people are doing shallow breathing, so you want to be able to do deep breathing. The yogis have developed very powerful breathing methods. And I'll show you one way to optimize your breathing. And very often you'll see in people who do breathing work of diaphragmatic breathing where the belly comes out as opposed to chest breathing where the chest is coming out. That's the chest breathing, but you have diaphragmatic breathing where the belly is coming out. So, uh, when you, when you do, so a very good way of doing it is inhaling through the nostrils, holding the air for, for about four to five seconds, giving the, that gives a chance for the oxygen to come out of the lungs into the blood and then go be carried into all the cells of the body. So you hold it for about four seconds and then exhale slowly through the mouth. And as you're exhaling it slowly, you're still absorbing oxygen because when you exhale, typically, not only carbon dioxide, you have oxygen. So you, want to, you, don't want to, you don't want to give up too much of that oxygen so by exhaling slowly through the mouth. Now, this is not how you're going to breathe all day, but when you're doing your breathing work, this is, this is what you would do. So I'll demonstrate it to you. Now, it's good for a few of those breaths to push out all the air, so that way you bring in a lot more oxygen. So I pushed it all out. I'll do one more. I did three. Now, the people that can meditate on their breathing go 20 minutes, an hour. The yogis can do it for many hours. I'm an American. I really don't have the patience for it, so I'll do two or three deep breaths and do it throughout the day. When I wake up, when I go to sleep, throughout the day, I'll do it. It's good if you get 10 or 15 minutes during the day. I doubt if I get that much just because I don't have the patience for it, but it's a good thing to do. Now, the other way of increasing your oxygen particularly when you're working out, is to have an oxygen mask turning up to four liters per minute. And you, you get a, a tank such as this with a mask, and I've used that during exercise, and you really oxygenate all your organs. You oxygenate your organs because you, you're really needing that oxygen. So if you're doing bench presses, you're doing curls, or whatever exercise you're doing, you're, getting, you're oxygenating yourself. And you can do that for maybe uh, up to 15 minutes where you turn on four liters a minute, uh, and then it just really saturates you with oxygen. Now, if somebody wants to really saturate themselves, they can get hyperbaric oxygen, which was initially used uh, where you're getting oxygen under pressure, and it just forces air into oxygen throughout your whole body. Your brain saturates you with it. used to be people, deep sea divers coming up, getting the bends coming up, shaking. They'd give them uh, hyperbaric oxygen, oxygenate them, and they'd come out of it. But it turns out that hyperbaric oxygen also facilitates wound healing, so let's say, or a burn healing. So everything is sped up on the in more intense oxygenation. And so and there's some uh, evidence that after a stroke that people can recover more of their brain function uh, on, the, on the hyperbaric oxygen. We're just forcing uh, oxygen to saturate the entire body. It's under very high pressure, high pressure oxygenation. That's called hyperbaric oxygenation. Uh, it's not covered under uh, health policies at this time uh, for stroke. Uh, but there are hospitals that will do, particularly if it's a teaching college, and they might have that available. But, or you can pay. You can go to hyperbaric oxygen chambers and, and pay to have that done. So you have the oxygen, the hemoglobin, iron, amongst many other. Uh, now, vitamin, uh, vitamin E helps uh, maximize oxygen utilization and coenzyme Q10. So the oxygen along with either glucose or fatty acids are burned in the mitochondria of your cells. All you, every cell in your body, in your muscles, in your brain, every organ has mitochondria. And those mitochondria burn adenosine triphosphate, which is ATP. So you have adenosine attached to three phosphate molecules. And as those bonds uh, are released, it releases energy. So you can get contraction and movement, whatever, whatever, whatever the function is. And then it goes to adenosine uh, biphosphate, adenosine monophosphate. But when that's happening, it's burning up uh, sugars, it's burning up uh, uh, fatty acids, but it's also, it also needs oxygen for that combustion to happen. So you're burning oxygen in the mitochondria. You have to have that oxygen. You can live, 
you know, quite some time without food, less long without water. But oxygen you really need, you, can, you know, you, you can't go very long without it. It's just that vital. Uh, and that's like a key dimension in terms of when people wonder where there are, what planets have life. You want to find water and presumably oxygen, but definitely water and, and, and presumably oxygen as well so they can support life as we know it in any case. So oxygenation... Uh, you can maximize it. So coenzyme Q10 helps facilitate the oxygen uh, efficiency in the mitochondria. The oxygen efficiency. And as people get older, they, they're, they're absorbing less of their oxygen. So you want to get like oxygen dissolved in, in a liquid. You can get it or using um, oxygen mask. Of course, the simplest way is to be able to get oxygenated water or an oxygenated drink of some kind increase it that way and take the minerals, uh, mineral complexes that will facilitate that oxygen absorption. And certainly it's going to include, uh, certainly going to include vitamin E. And CoQ10, as I said, is also very good in addition uh, in terms of doing that. Now, along these lines, so, one, so the first fountain of youth we're talking about is oxygen. The second fountain of youth is exercise. Exercise... Uh, is going to increase your oxygenation, for one thing, because particularly aerobic, if you're running, jogging, sprinting, you're increasing your oxygen coming in. You're breathing more, breathing more deeply, your pump, your heart's pumping more, so you're getting more oxygen into all your organs. And uh, even if somebody's doing weightlifting, that could become aerobic exercise, because you do, let's say, uh, 10 reps of curls, and then you rest and then you, and you go to a second set, another 10. Well, if you don't rest much, if there's a short pause, instead of going a minute or two minutes, you just go 20 or 30 seconds, your, heart, your heart's going to be beating faster and you can get more of an aerobic. You could actually, weightlifting can then become with shorter intervals between sets and aerobic workouts. So you're now you're getting strength building, which also is extremely good, by the way. Strength building, we're doing heavy lifting and the exercises it actually develops more mitochondria in your brain. It develops more mitochondria in your brain. And certainly aerobic exercise is very good for the cardiovascular system, very good for strengthening the heart, very good for the, for the arteries and veins. But the weight-bearing exercise will actually increase muscle density, and, 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 and that muscle density will then uh, be able to burn up body fat. So when you're building muscle, you're even raising metabolism, so even while you sleep, you're burning, you're burning fat with that muscle that you have. Also, when you're doing weight-bearing exercise, you're strengthening your bones. If, if somebody's been working out and take a fall or, God forbid, in a car accident or whatever, they're less likely to get that bone breaking. It keeps the bones more dense. So you're getting more mitochondria, you're getting bone density, uh, muscle strength, and muscle size, strengthening the tendons and ligaments. So uh, this is all extremely healthy for you in maximizing the oxygen utilization and at the same time uh, helping to keep your blood sugar levels in normal range. And we're going to talk more about that. Helping to keep your blood sugar in normal range. Now, when you're going heavy weights, such as compound movements like a bench press, a deadlift, a squat with heavy weights, those are called compound movements. And you maybe, if you want to go like four sets of maybe five reps, because that will build up the, uh, the myofibrils of the actin and the myosin. The myofibrils will actually get bigger, the actual muscle fiber. When you, when you see bodybuilders, they'll do some of that, but powerlifters will go about five reps, four sets of five reps of these basic uh, compound movements. But bodybuilders will do like 15 reps with lighter weight, and that builds up the sarcoplasm, the energy fluid around the muscle get more water, more mitochondria built up, glycogen stores, that's in the, in the sarcoplasm. So when you see somebody that's very muscular, uh, it could be these have a lot of sarcoplasm. And in fact, if, if somebody uh, stops working out, if, you, they have, if they've just been doing a bodybuilding routine, they'll lose muscle mass at a faster rate than somebody that's been a power lift who's built up the myofibrils. That, those fibers will stay thick for a longer period of time. So it's good to combine the power lifting heavy lifting, and particularly starting a workout with the heavy lifts, because why? It increases testosterone. So if you want to build big biceps, it said, well, do squats. People go, what? Why would do squats help with biceps? Well, by doing squats with heavy weights, you increase your testosterone. 
and your testosterone. And then when you're doing curls, your biceps will get bigger because you have more testosterone. Lifting heavy weights will increase your testosterone. You want, men particularly want a good level of testosterone. There are other ways of increasing testosterone, such as olive oil, other ways. But that's a really powerful way of doing that. There are certain supplements like tribulus that can increase it. Uh, and then you could also be to get more free testosterone, christen. But you definitely want to be doing some of that heavy lifting. And then the, the high rep is more, it's, it's not only weightlifting and strengthening your bones and your muscles, but you're getting more of aerobic because you're, getting, you're going for those reps. And then you get a burn. After a while it goes, oh, yes, it just burns. You're getting into that burn. And when it starts burning, it gets really uncomfortable. You want to keep going some reps into it. Why? Well, that lactic acid that's building up will stimulate growth hormone production. You want to increase your growth hormone production, men and women, because your growth hormones will burn up your body fat, refertilize your hair, nails, and skin, strengthen your muscles, increase sexual potency and energy, strengthen your immune system. You want those growth hormones, and that burning sensation will certainly do that. There are other ways of increasing growth hormone production, such as taking large dosages of uh, L-arginine with L-lysine, uh, or large dosages of L-glutamine, amino acids. These will increase growth hormone production as well. So the exercise, you want to maximize your anabolic process of, of muscle building up, protein synthesis, and the most powerful uh, anabolic amino acid is L-leucine, which is one of the three branched-chain amino acids. The branched-chain amino acids are L-leucine, isoleucine, and L-valine. So when you're taking the branched-chain amino acid, you get that out of leucine, that will maximize muscle development. It will maximize the anabolic process. Cortisol, which you get under stress, or you see people that run long distances and they become skin and bone, max because the cortisol goes up. And the cortisol will catabolize the catabolic process of eating up your muscles. And typically when you sleep, your, your body might start eating up muscles. Why? Because muscles are very metabolically expensive. It takes a lot of calories to keep it so the body will tend to eat it up if you're not using it and if you don't have enough protein. So people that want to keep their muscles, it's good in the evening if you take some kind of amino acids or protein so that way it minimizes your catabolic process while you're sleeping. And remember this about exercise. If you take off for one week, which is a good idea, say every 10 weeks, you'll get stronger. If you take off two weeks, you'll get weaker. One week stronger, two weeks weaker. So you need to know these things. So you want to maximize your antibiotic process. And that includes women. You're not going to get all buffed and big. You know, you're not taking steroids. But you want to keep that muscle tone. You want to keep that figure. You want to minimize the waist size. Now, one of the other, or uh, well, we'll come back into that afterwards. But now, we're talking about exercise. So much more I could be saying. We're talking about oxygen. We're talking about exercise. Uh, the third fountain of youth is a psychological, spiritual dimension. It's honor. Honor. When you dishonor yourself, you cause stress, you cause bad consequences, you cause bad karma, bad things start happening to you, you've offended people, you've done things, bad things start happening because of that. And also you can feel guilty, uh, and the guilt will, will, will disturb you. Uh, and so the dishonor will cause, well, it could interfere with your sleep, with your eating, because of the stress that it produces. So honor, living an honorable life, will give you Peace of mind. Peace of mind. And the beautiful thing about honor is nobody can take it from you. Nobody. Only you can give it up. Somebody might take your wealth. Somebody could take your, maybe lose your wife, lose your house, lose, lose whatever. But nobody can take your honor. Nobody. So we're going to talk about how to develop your honor. And it has it's a psychological, it's a psychology of honor and basically the science of holiness. Now, from the beginning of time, people have always valued honor. Every one of you values it. You want to be a, a man of honor, a woman of honor. So we have a pledge to be a disciple of honor. And the disciple of honor repeats these four commandments three times a day. They go either, God, you wish is my only wish. If they don't want to address God, they say, I seek always to serve my highest values, or I choose honor above all else. That's the first commandment. The second is, I wish you well. The third is, I take full responsibility for co-creating my reality, my problems. And the fourth is, I'm grateful for the power I gain from hardship. So those are the four commandments of honor. 
And then we have 25 laws of honor. We've talked about that in other lectures, but I'll just talk about the four commandments right now. Now, people will sell out their honor for typically three things, money, sex, and power. And they'll do that, only, you'll only, people will only succumb to temptation if there is a temptation. So how do you eliminate temptation? You eliminate temptation when it's not an option. And I use this example, I repeat it many times, many things are repeat, repetition because I want it to be as if your father whispered this in your ear since you were a child, to be a part of you all your lives. Somebody's been smoking three packs of cigarettes for 30 years and they can't stop, but then you hire a mafioso to follow him around with a 45, point to right at his head, and he knows for sure this guy will blow his brains out if he touches a cigarette. He can't say, hey, Tony, go get me a pizza. No, Tony's not going to get you a pizza. He's going to follow you with that. i got to go to the bathroom, Tony. He's going to follow you to the bathroom. So once you're convinced he's going to blow your brains out, you touch that cigarette, guess what happens? You won't touch the cigarette. And guess what else? You won't even be tempted. You only be tempted if you think you can send him to get the pizza. <laughs> So that's how you eliminate temptation. It has to not be an option. So one way, so the three guardian thoughts that will protect you against temptation, which will reduce the options. One is, I choose honor above all else. Honor is all I have. But the most powerful one, the most powerful, is death before dishonor. I'd rather die than dishonor myself. Now, you might slip once in a while, say something you shouldn't have said. But as soon as you see it, you repent and go, hey, wait a minute, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry I did that. I really apologize. So then you're back in the way of honor. So it doesn't mean you're going to be a perfect human being. Just as soon as you see that you dishonored yourself by breaking your commandments, whoa, wait a minute, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. Just like that, you come right back into honor, right away, that you're still on the path of honor. Death before dishonor. Now, dishonor is death. So when you say death before dishonor, what are you saying? I'm pro-life. I choose life. Think about it. Death bring, dishonor brings a death process. You feel guilty, uh, you become paranoid, you lose your trust in other people because you're concerned because you've done something dishonorable. So honor brings life. So when you go death before dishonor, you don't want to die and dishonor yourself. No, you're saying, I'm not, I feel so strongly about this, I'd rather die than dishonor myself. And if I do something dishonorable, I will rectify it immediately and come back into honor. So it, so it goes this way, death before dishonor, okay? Now, the understanding of elucidating some of that came in my conversation with Alex Torres, which is the reason I'm dedicating this lecture to him. So here's how it goes. Now, here's how it goes now. I'm going to do the commandments, and then I'm going to show you what you follow the commandments with. So I use God in this case. You might want to use, I seek always to serve my highest values. Well, just to keep it neutral, I'll say I choose honor above all else. We'll keep it more neutral. I choose honor above all else. I wish you well. I take full responsibility for co-creating my reality and my problems, and I'm grateful for the power I gain from hardship. Death before dishonor. So you're having that. So now this, it's stepped up. Now, imagine a thousand people all doing that, in which case a thousand people would be going, death before dishonor. Death before dishonor. Death before dishonor. Now I'm going to ask you to do that with me. So you're hitting right up over here. We'll do it together and we'll repeat death before dishonor. Death before dishonor. Loud. Death before dishonor. Death before dishonor. Death before dishonor. Death before dishonor. dishonor. You've got to be feeling that. You've got to be feeling that. Now, I'm going to demonstrate the shake. Now, this takes you uh, to becoming an elite disciple of honor. Henry, come up a second. I want to demonstrate something, please. I'm going to show you the handshake for the elite for disciples of honor. We're going to shake hands, but let me show you. Come over, step, step in the same. Okay, right, we're going to shake hands, but it's going to be like that. So we're like this. Now, death before dishonor. Death before dishonor. Okay, thank you. That's the handshake. That's the handshake. That's before dishonor. So when you have elite disciples of honor, it's that way. You're looking in each other's eyes. You're, you're comm- and so now you have a commitment to yourself. If you believe in God to your, or your higher power, you have a commitment there. But now you have a, a public commitment, a social commitment. Death before dishonor. You feel the power? You see, how, you want to reduce the temptation, the option of ever breaking that. And if you do, 
And we all do. You get in that, you say something you shouldn't have said. You know, somebody says something irritates you. You come back. Oh, wait, wait, wait a minute. Oh, I'm so sorry. Please right, forgive me. You just go back right on the path, and then that too, that's a, that's a repentance. Your repentance. So then you become redeemed through that repentance, that apology, that asking forgiveness. So you need to know on this path, as a human being, once in a while something gets to you, you react maybe because you're tired, you're hot, you're sick, you're hungry. You know, the kids are just driving you nuts, you know, whatever, and then you snap for a second. As soon as you catch up, oh my God, what do I do? I'm so sorry. I'm so, so sorry. Okay? And then you're back, you've, you've repented, and you've now redeemed yourself on the path of, path of honor. So you haven't betrayed it, you had that slip, but you, through the, the repentance, you're redeemed right away. You need to know that. I have to tell you that. As human beings, I, I live pretty, really high on this whole thing. Where I'm 76. At your ages, I didn't. But once in a while, I'll slip. My wife will say something, whatever, and I, and, and I love her. I just the love of my life, but she'll say something, or complaining about something I did. And I say, why do you always complain? You know, oh, but I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. Forgive me. I'm sorry. And you just go right there. As soon, as soon as I catch it, you know, but you want to catch it early. And you know, I'll tell you what. Every thought, word, and action can be weighed in the scale of honor. You know every time you're dishonoring yourself with your thought, your word, and your action. You know instantly. You may not want to admit it immediately, but, you know, a minute later, some of you might need more time. But the quicker, the better. Now, to, to be able to do that, to repent, you have to be able to take responsibility. I take full responsibility for co-creating my reality and my problems. You have to be able to do that. And you have to be aware and self-honest. You have to be honest with yourself. Because if you're not honest with yourself, you just build a case. This son of a gun is always doing it. You can get more and more worked up justifying that you got nasty. Oh, he deserved it. What do you mean? I say, he deserves it. And you build it, you just keep it going. So I'm trying to help you. So, so one of the fountains of youth is honor. So you have oxygen, exercise, honor. First three of the 25, okay? Three of the 20. They're, they're all fountains of youth, every one of them. Now in understanding, in understanding the other, uh, what we talked about, I'll go to the fourth one, which is muscle mass. To the extent you have muscle, muscle, you know, I talk about huge muscles, it could be huge, it's good, that's going to burn the body fat. And the body fat you want to burn particularly off of the visceral area. For men, if your waist is 40 inches, you're more prone to diabetes, you're going to have a shorter lifespan. For women, 35 inches, you're more prone to diabetes. The smaller your waist, the longer your life. And so exercise, building the muscle mass was one, one way. Because certainly having low glycemic carbs uh, will, will reduce your, 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 your body fat. It will reduce your body fat. But muscle mass is an important part. And you build that muscle mass, you're exercising, you're doing weights, you're doing cardio, whatever exercise you do. Dr. Nurmer's four laws of exercise are these. And it took me 60 years to articulate this. Never quit. No excuses. The best time to work out is now. And the worst time is later. Okay? Never quit. No excuses. Now, not later. If you remember those four, you'll always be okay. My exercise routine has changed over the years. I used to work out three times a week for maybe an hour each time. Now I work out three times a day. I work out now three times a day. And, and, but, 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 there's a big but on that. It's sometimes just five minutes. Five minutes to 20 minutes. Now always remember this about exercise. And the hardest part is getting started. If you commit, if you're not in a routine right now, commit to three minutes a day. Three minutes. Why? Because then you got a momentum, three minutes. Three minutes could turn into 20, or three minutes may just be three minutes. I did my three minutes, I'm out of here, I hate this. No problem. But get this, it's easier to go from three minutes to an hour than it is from zero to three, okay? It's easier to go from three minutes to an hour of workout than it is from zero to three, because you have a momentum going. There are days I'm tired, I come home, I don't want to do anything. I just go in the garage, I do you know, whatever, I'm just tired, I'm feeling weak, I'm up. You know, three to five minutes, and I'm, I'm out. I put it down, I'm gone. Or I just get down and do some push-ups, whatever. That's it. But I've learned to practice what I preach, you know. 
So that's in terms of muscle mass. And keep in mind, the muscles will help keep your blood sugar in a normal range. See, normally you need insulin to bring the sugar to the receptor sites, and then the insulin unlocks that receptor site, and then the glucose goes into the cells. But with exercise, a glute 4 enzyme takes it right, shuttles the glucose right in, shuttles it right into the muscles, the nerves, whatever the, whatever the, the organs are, the, the tissue is, shuttles it right in without insulin. Without insulin. That's how powerful exercise is. It helps keep blood sugar in normal range. And with that, we're going to go to blood sugar. Now, blood sugar, when you get a blood test, you always want to get your blood sugar, your fasting glucose level. You want to get also your A1C, which is an average over about three months of what it is. So you naturally want to keep your A1C under 5.7. And they'll tell you, and you want to really keep it closer to 5. It's optimal. So 5.7 .7 is then considered, uh, you, you, you're into a metabolic syndrome range. Then, so you really want to keep it 5.6 or less. And if you're under 100, they'll tell you, well, you're normal. But you don't ever want normal. Never be satisfied with normal. You want optimal. Let me tell you, if your blood sugar is 95, which is normal, you're more prone to Alzheimer's. You're more prone to Alzheimer's if your fasting glucose level is 95. You don't want that. You want an optimal. Optimal is somewhere in the range of 75 to 85. Some people say 70 to 85, but let's use 75 to 85. Optimal glucose reading. If it gets higher, let's say you're running 110, 115, you're not diabetic, but it will damage your vision. It will damage your kidneys. That just gooks up your whole system. It causes end organ damage. You don't want it in that range. You don't want it there. And there are a number of ways to bring your blood sugar down. One is exercise. If, it, if, you, if you're diabetic and it gets to 126 and above, metformin, beautiful drugs. It lowers the insulin resistance. And the side effect is it prevents various cancers. Beautiful medication, metformin. But on natural substances, you have berberine, which has been around for thousands of years, been used in India and China. Berberine, 500 milligrams three times a day. Cinnamon. A couple of capsules three times a day. Bitter melon, chromium piclinate, banaba, gymnemna, natural substances, amla, all bringing your blood sugar down in a natural way. But if you're on metformin, don't be afraid of it. It's a good medication, probably the best of them all. But these are natural ways to bring it down. But exercise is certainly one of the key ones. So you want to keep it 75 to 85 optimal. And in general, you want to be, actually become a wellness warrior. A wellness warrior uh, seeks optimal health, not normal. It takes medicine 20 years. In the past, it's taken hundreds of years to catch up with what the empirical date is, really. It could take 20 years. The time that they found out that lemons could prevent scurvy in the sailors. It was a horrible death. Sailors were dying at sea. The British sailors, the other sailors, dying on sea. Just horrible deaths. And they found lemons could cut it down. They found that. They didn't know it was vitamin C and it was the lemon. It was a couple hundred years till they started doing it. If it was actually found, a couple hundred years. And they even started using limes, which wasn't as good. And that's why they called the British sailors limeys. Washing your hands, cutting down complications in surgery it took maybe a hundred years or longer until they started using that. Penicillin, from the time it was discovered as an antibiotic that was used, was at least 20 years. So the mainstream medicine is typically way behind applying what we already know empirically. We're not talking about what you heard from, you know, a relative or whatever. We're talking, you know, double-blind studies, empirical studies out of major labs such as Harvard. Mainstream medicine, for the most part, has not heard of omega-7. Everyone knows omega-3, but omega-7 reduces triglycerides, helps control blood sugar, and works synergistically with the omega-3 that you can get from fish oil, and you can get it from flaxseed and chia seed, uh, and, other, and, and walnuts and many other uh, plants. But when you take it with omega-7, which you can get omega-7 from plants or distilled from the fish oil, it works synergistically and helps control blood sugar and triglycerides. You've never heard of it outside of my lectures, and, and your doctor probably has never heard of it. And we're talking, this is at least five years that Harvard Lab published studies on, five years. So it's going to take at least 
20 years till many of these things we're talking about become mainstream. Okay. Now, so one of the fountains of youth is to reduce, to get your blood sugar at an optimal level. So the fountain of youth is one side. The other thing is the fountain of aging. So the way the fountain of youth is based on the opposite of the aging is you get your blood sugar is up, your organs are going to start going, your gums are going to start getting infected. So that's the aging. Well, do you keep it an optimal? It becomes a fountain of youth. If it goes outside of optimal, it becomes a fountain of aging. It becomes a fountain of death. You're either going to drink from the fountain of death or the fountain of life. When you drink from the fountain of life, that's one of the fountains of, of youth. You keep more, youth, more youthful. So you want to keep your blood sugar in optimal range, and that's one of the fountains of youth, is to keep it from 75 to 85. Now, another one is homocysteine. Homocysteine is a protein in your bloodstream that actually you want to keep it under 13, but, but optimal is 7 to 8. 7 to 8. If it's above, you know, you start getting 11, 12, 13, 14, you're more prone to Alzheimer's. You're more prone to having a stroke, a heart attack. See, your doctor, if you don't tell him to take your homocysteine, guess what? He won't take it. You say, Doc, I want to know my homocysteine. All right. You don't ask for it, you don't get it. He'll take your cholesterol. He'll take your LDL, your HDL, your triglycerides, but he won't do that. You guys, I need to know my homocysteine. Now, if your homocysteine is elevated, which mine was, you can bring it down. That's the fountain of youth. This knowledge I'm giving you allows the fountain of youth to operate. How do you bring it down? Folic acid. Some people take bigger dosages than others. You need to take more than 1,000 micrograms. I'll use from 1,000 to 5,000 micrograms because 500 micrograms wasn't doing it. 800 wasn't doing it. It was still staying 10, 9 in my case. So I, I upped it to uh, anywhere between 2 to 5,000 micrograms. And then you work synergistically with B12 and B6 and TMG. So you start taking that, and I got my homocysteine down to about 7.5. From, from 11, and it kept going up, 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 and I kept, then I started increasing my dosage from the, uh, the folic acid. Okay, so you can, you, can, you can drink from the fountain of youth. You can drink from the fountain, and, the, and, and the, the fountain is made of this knowledge, this knowledge I'm talking to you. That gets your homocysteine down, makes you less prone to Alzheimer's, less prone to cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, and strokes. Now, the next fountain of, of youth is cholesterol. If your cholesterol, your total cholesterol, is under 150, it's impossible to develop plaque. If your cholesterol is under 150 and your LDL, low-density lipoproteins, is under 80, you can't develop plaque. Isn't that great? What is plaque? Plaque starts building on your arteries, closing it up. And that's a problem. It's a real problem when it ruptures, the plaque breaks off and moves. Why? because then blood platelets come to where it broke off, treats it as a wound, and so those blood platelets get sticky. Plug it up. It plugs it up. What happens? It plugs up your arteries, so now the blood can't get through. What happens? Your heart's not getting oxygen. Heart attack. Stroke. If it's in your coronary arteries, it's a stroke. If it's in your, if it's in your, your carotid arteries, stroke. If it's in your, some of your arteries in your brain, stroke. If it's in if it's your coronary arteries, heart attack. So you don't want, it's your own blood platelets that typically cause a heart attack. Typically cause a heart attack. A doctor might give you a clot buster, you know, uh, to, to break it up, or might put you on a blood thinner like Plavix and aspirin, whatever, to keep that from getting sticky that way, or stronger ones. So your cholesterol, so now we'll go from there into, well, we'll go into, uh, the cholesterol, the triglycerides and, and HDL. So the triglycerides are fatty acids that, that are not good fatty acids going. You want to keep that under 100. They'll tell you under 150 is normal. You really want under 100. Triglycerides going up uh, is dangerous for you. You don't want those triglycerides going up. You want to keep it under 100. How do you do that? Fish oil. You take a gram, to five or six grams of fish oil, that'll come down. And guess what? 
when your triglycerides comes down, guess what goes up? Your HDL, your high density lipoproteins. When those go up, that's your good cholesterol. HDL is your good cholesterol. It actually transports the negative cholesterol out of your body. So you want your HDL up. Typically you want over 50 for, for men, over 60 for women. You want to raise your HDL. And one way of doing that is to take down your triglycerides. Fish oil would do that. Now, so we talked about plaque building up. One of the other fountains of, of youth is based on in terms of minimizing plaque. So you want to prevent the plaque from building up. You want to prevent it. One way of doing it, of course, is statin drug, Crestol, Lipitor, whatever. But there are natural ways also to help prevent it. Uh, Pantothene, 300 milligrams, three times a day. Red rice yeast, plant sterols will help reduce your cholesterol. Will help reduce it. And having, uh, eating a lot of plants, you get a lot of broccoli, a lot of green vegetables, will also help reduce it. Saturated fats, if you get too much of it, a little bit you have to have, but if you get too much of it, you're more likely to develop plaque. So the three things about your plaque, and this is one of the fountains of youth, is plaque optimization or plaque minimization is one of the fountains of youth. So you want to prevent it. Okay. Number two, once it's there, you want to reduce it. How do you reduce it? Garlic will reduce the plaque. Garlic will actually take off an, over about a five-year period by 3%, and people not on garlic will actually increase their plaque by 3% over those five years. And lecithin will also dissolve it. So that's how you remove it. But there's a third part. You want to stabilize. You don't want it rupturing because it ruptures. What happens? The blood platelets come there. They're treated as a wound. You get a heart attack because now the blood platelets aggregate. They're sticking, blocking the blood. So you want to stabilize it. How do you do that? How do you do that? Well, statins will help stabilize it, and that's by, by prescription. But carnosine will, a natural substance, carnosine will help stabilize it. Go to cola will help stabilize it. So there are natural substances you could take to help stabilize the plaque. So you want to prevent it, reduce it, stabilize it. And you want to get collagen, when it's, when it's capped with collagen and, and calcium, it's less likely to rupture. So. Prevention, reduction, stabilization of the plaques, one of the fountains. All disease begins, whether you're talking about cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, arthritis, Alzheimer's, all begins with chronic inflammation. One very good measure of chronic inflammation is C-reactive protein on the CRP. You want to reduce your inflammation. You want to keep it under 3, preferably under 1, and ideally under 0.2, or under 0.1 is even better. You want to reduce it to under 0.1. You want it under 0.1. How do you do that? You want to take natural anti-inflammatories. Pycnogenol. Pycnogenol is one of them. Garlic. Ginger. Curcumin. That curcumin helps prevent cancer. It helps with inflammation. I mean, these are all miracle things. Garlic, ginger, curcumin. And for thousands of years, known to, to lead to enormous health benefits. But now we're talking about studies showing that those are natural anti-inflammatories, just like pycnogenol. So you can just go buy these things and be taking it or getting it any way you can from natural foods. Put a lot of curry, garlic, and ginger on your foods. That's not as good as the pill, but it's, it's really good. Natural inflammatory is also resveratrol. Resveratrol is known as a CR mimetic. What is a CR mimetic? You have, if you reduce your calories by 25%, you'll increase your lifespan. The telomeres, which are the, like the caps right on your chromosomes, just like you've got a plastic at the end of the shoelace to keep it from unraveling, you've got these telomeres at the end. And as they get shorter and shorter and shorter, every time the cell divides, it gets to a point where it's senescent and it's not going to divide anymore. Then it, begins pro it starts producing inflammatory molecules. So you want to keep the telomere long by increasing telomerase activity. Well, the telomerase activity is stimulated by calorie restriction, CR, or CR mimetics. What are the CR mimetics? Resveratrol, physidin, pterostilbene, whey protein, grapeseed extract, will all have that effect. Basically, you're activating longevity genes. But also, resveratrol is an anti-inflammatory. It also helps release nitrous oxide. We're going to talk about that in a minute, what that does in the blood vessel. We'll go to that now. So you want to reduce your CRP. You want to keep it down. And so you got to tell your doctor, Doc, I want my homocysteine. I want to also know my CRP. My high sensitivity CRP, I want to know it. 
If you don't tell them you want to see it, he's not going to take it. He'll get your cholesterol. He'll get you your HDL, your LDL, your triglycerides, but he won't get your homocysteine or your CRP unless you say, Doc, I really want to see what's going on. Then, <laughs> if you have, if you have a, uh, an HMO, they may not want to do it because now you represent a cost. If a PPO, say, oh, you need it. Yeah, we'll order it. More likely to get it with a PPO. Because the HMOs, the business of it is every time you come to see the doctor, you don't represent cash flow, you represent an expense. Now you're an expense. PPO, you come in, the doctor works for you. Oh, yeah, you want that? Yes, sir. He orders it, he makes money, they make the labs make money, everybody's making money, everybody's happy if they can justify using it. They have to have somebody to be able to have a, a reasonable medical justification to do it. You just can't do anything. But already the HMOs, many of the doctors don't work for you. They work for the, the organization. And you have to keep cost, cost minimization. It's just part of the business of medicine, right? Yeah. So you want to keep your CRP. You want to be asking for that. Now, the other, one other factor is, is you want to keep your bone dense. You want to keep your bones in your body strong. Now, I already talked about exercise does that. You certainly want to have adequate calcium. But if you get, if, let's say you take a calcium pill, dangerous. If you take calcium pills, it's dangerous. You got to take calcium, magnesium, and D, and K2. If you don't have K2, guess what? Instead of the calcium going into your bones, it could go into your arteries. Instead of the calcium going into your bones, it could go into your arteries. You don't want it in your arteries. That's a, you don't want calcification of your arteries. You don't want hardening, hardening of the arteries. So whenever you're taking calcium, particularly as a supplement, but in any way, you want to be, make sure you're getting magnesium, vitamin D, and vitamin K2. Absolutely you got to have that. You get some vitamin K from spinach and green leafy vegetables like kale, but it's good to, but a, a supplement's a good way to get a full range of the K vitamins. So there are studies where people say, oh, don't take calcium, you can get a heart attack. Well, it's true. You don't want to take just great calcium. It's got to be with magnesium, vitamin D, and K2. Then, then you're safe. So you want to now. We, we talked about uh, resveratrol also helping with nitrous oxide. So your blood vessels, your arteries have three layers: the connective tissue, smooth muscle which contracts, so the, the, the blood vessels constrict or expand, and then endothelial cells. The inner line is endothelial cells. So, one source of aging is called endothelial dysfunction. So, one fountain of death is endothelial dysfunction. That's where the endothelial cells not release nitrous oxide and it can't open. So, it stays very narrow. And when it's narrow, that raises your blood pressure. So, endothelial, so the fountain of life is to keep that flexible. You want to keep the, the endothelial cells working in nitrous oxide, expanding your vessels. Well, resveratrol is one that'll do that. Cocoa, having chocolate, particularly high cocoa content, at least 70%, 85 is even better. 95 gets too bitter. Uh, cacao, you put in, there's no sugar, and it's awful, but you mix it with a drink, it's okay. That's 100%, but if you take, 90% is pretty delicious. I like it, 85%, but most of you will, will like the 70%. You want to go 50% because you got a lot of sugar in it. So you want to, cocoa will, will increase, pure cocoa without mixed with sugar, uh, or at least 70% to, to 90 will increase the endothelial function. You want to take a couple of squares, you don't want to eat the whole can. A couple of squares of that will keep your endothelial working well. It's good for your cardiovascular system. And nitrous oxide will help prevent endothelial dysfunction. So, so endothelial uh, endothelial optimization is a fountain of youth. Endothelial dysfunction is a fountain of death. Endothelial optimization is, a fountain, is one of the fountains of life. Resveratrol will do that. Uh, cocoa will do that. So you want to maximize endothelial optimization. You absolutely got to do that. Absolutely got to do that. Now, as I said, if the, if the blood vessel gets uh, too narrow, your blood pressure goes up. 
Well, let me tell you, optimal blood pressure is 115 over 75. 115 over 75. 115 is a systolic, diastolic is 75. And you want to keep your pulse rate under 70. You have a shorter lifespan if your pulse rate goes over 70. You want to keep it preferably low 60s or in the 50s. Elite athletes can keep it in the high 40s, particularly if they do a lot of aerobics. But you can keep it in the high 50s, low 60s. You don't want it in the 70s. Some people just naturally have, they're just born with in the 80s, 90s, whatever. But if you do a lot of aerobic exercise, it'll help bring that down. Aerobic exercise will help lower your pulse rate for endothelial function. Now, the other related to that uh, is you want to keep a strong heart where the beat is strong. It's coming together strong. It's called an ejection fraction. Every time it constricts, it just sends a lot of blood just flowing out. It's called the ejection fraction. You want to keep it around 65%. Even though I had a heart attack when I was 61, when I did my ejection fraction uh, two years ago, it was 65. Why? Because certain things will optimize the ejection fraction of your heart. Certain things will optimize it. So one fountain of youth is the ejection fraction optimization. When people have heart failure, they might have 30%. You know, it's, it's, it's a pretty weak beat. And it's, it's a problem, serious problem. So ejection fraction optimization Dr. Frank Sinatra, Dr. Stephen Sinatra, the leading cardiologist in alternative medicine, said the awesome four for the heart are D-ribose, L-carnitine, uh, the magnesium, and coenzyme Q10. D-ribose, magnesium, L-carnitine, coenzyme Q10. We were on that, and I take those. I had a 65% ejection fraction. I was so happy with that. So we talked, we talked also about the telomeres, which is another keeping the telomeres uh, maximized uh, because you don't want to have senescence. You don't want, you want this getting shorter and shorter and shorter because as they get shorter, they don't, they don't start dividing anymore. You have cellular senescence, which leads to pro-inflammatory molecules. You don't want inflammation. So we talked about doing, keeping telomere optimization. Uh, now, cell senescence is, is a fountain of death. Because when you have cells that are not doing anything, they're just hanging out, they're, 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 not, they're old and they're just laying and not being removed. So the way you prevent senescence, particularly you don't want to have immune cell senescence, where the immune cells are not functioning. Well, you don't want to have that. So, so coracetin combined with tocotrienols of vitamin E will help with minimizing the senescence process and get, lead to... Uh, actually senescence optimization, we, we're minimizing that. Now you want to be able to, uh, we've talked about the waist size in terms of maximizing uh, waist size optimization, one of the fountains, you want to keep, keep your, for men under, under 40, women under 35 inches. 35 inches. Uh, you want to minimize your glycation, this is where your proteins are being uh, compromised by sugar, so you don't want to have protein and high glycemic carbs together but also carnosine will help reduce will help reduce the glycation process. If you're taking carnosine, will reduce the glycation process. You don't you don't you don't want that will age you. That will age you to the extent you're getting a glycation process going on. All right, so we talk about senescence. You want to keep your thyroid function maximized, optimized. You want to keep your TSH between one and two. I want to keep between one and two. And certainly, uh, you, you want to, uh, you, you want you, you know, your T3 and T4. T3 is the active form of the, of the hormone. And uh, uh, you, you want oxygen to help keep, uh, help keep that an optimized, changing the T4 to the T3. Ejection fraction. So now, we talked about the mitochondria. You want mitochondrial function optimization as opposed to mitochondrial dysfunction. Uh, you want to be getting, uh, increase the number of them through uh, PPQ will increase it. Exercise will increase your PPQ. The substance PPQ will maximize your mitochondria. And certainly uh, you want to have your, your D-ribose, which is burning the denizen triphosphate. You want to keep your immune system strong, immune senescence. When your immune system is compromised, which starts in the gut with all the uh, helpful bacteria. There's trillions of these bacteria that we have. There are more of them than there are of us. So you want to keep the immune system strong. You want to keep your, your NK cells strong, your T cells strong. 
Uh, you want, and so you wanted the certain mushrooms that will help do that. Certainly, garlic. The two ways preventing diseases. One is keep your immune system strong so the germs that are in you, the cancer cells that are in you, will be taken care of by your immune system. The other way is reducing your contact with those germs. But if your immune system is strong, you'll be able to take care of whatever's in there. We all have cancer cells in us. We have different germs. But you want your strong immune system and no ways to kill off the harmful germs like garlic. Well, olive leaf extract will help do that. And by the way, olive leaf extract will help reduce your blood pressure along with hawthorn berry. Hawthorn berry will also lead to uh, maximizing uh, uh, the, the ejection fraction. Talked about the plaque, talked about the endothelial. Then you have detoxification. The main detoxifier is your own, uh, is in your own body, the, the glutathione. And the glutathione production is maximized by taking some of NAC. You want to be detoxifying. That'll take the mercury out, take the copper, the aluminum excess, excesses out of your body because those will destroy you. So the glutathione, which your body makes, is stimulated by NAC. You can also find glutathione sometimes where your body can, can absorb it and handle it. So those are the 25, um, those are the 25 fountains of youth. We either going to drink from the fountain of death or the fountain of youth. It's up to you. You have the knowledge now to drink from the fountain of youth. I hope you, it is said that today the child has been born who will live to 150. You should make it to 120. But you have to start getting on these fountains now. Thank you. Thank you so much.